so I'm going to just go for it today. I don't know why, but I don't really question it. I don't, I don't mind whatever God wants. When I was asking him, or I don't really ask him, I'm more just open for him to tell me what to say anytime. And what I uh, was getting that it was just to literally speak on different points and the points have nothing to do with each other. Okay. Uh, so it's anyway, you'll see what I mean in a minute. If you read uh, Matthew chapter four, five and six, yeah, four, five and six will do it. Jesus changed subject over and over in that one sermon. Okay. So I'm going to kind of do the same. All right. So it's going to be a little bit different, but for, to start off with, um, next week, uh, we're do, going to do a baptism. Someone wants to get baptized, praise God. Lucas, he is right there. Bravo there, Lucas. So he's a, a wonderful brother. He's been amazing, like getting to know him a little bit. Uh, but yeah, he wants to, through the days and weeks he's been here, he just, he's asked to, wants to get baptized. So because we're going to baptize him next Sunday, probably we'll do it about... Uh, maybe two o'clock, maybe. I will announce it if anything changes. Um, I wanted to open it up for anyone else that wants to get baptized. Um, baptism was part of the whole uh, initial moving into uh, uh, belief in Jesus. Everywhere you see, it says, believe and be baptized, believe and be baptized, but they were together, believe and be baptized. And um, in Romans, it actually says that when we're baptized, we're baptized into his death. So when we're not baptized, we haven't actually officially entered into being baptized, submerged into what his death accomplished. If he says when we're baptized, we're baptized into his death, then if we're not being baptized, we haven't bab baptized into his death yet. And if you've been baptized when you were a baby, you have not been baptized. That was a religious routine that was given to us growing up. And it's innocent, but it still doesn't change how God put it together. And God said, once you believe you get baptized. A baby can't believe. So if you want to actually get baptized, tell me and we'll organize as well that for you as well to get baptized on next Sunday. Um, it's very serious in, in uh, I'll just say a couple of things about that. When we're born, it says in the Bible that we need to be born again. Born again is not a religion. Born again is something that we enter into. Never in the Bible does do the disciples ever say to people, hey, do you believe in Jesus? Good. Now you're born again. Say a prayer. Now you're born again. They never say this word. Only twice it's in the Bible. In John chapter 3, he says, unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said this to Nicodemus. Later, he says it again in 1 Peter. But he says you need to be born again. Being born again was an action of being baptized in water and baptized in the spirit. In other words, you kill your old self. That's what baptism is. It's not a symbol. It's not representing something. It's actually what's happening in the spiritual. So it's a physical thing we're doing, but it's to, to do, to activate something that's happening in the spiritual. So if you have not been baptized, we have to read what does baptism mean? And if you have not been baptized, this means you haven't entered into what baptism, only baptism gives you. You can't put something in its place. The Lord put it that way, and that's the only way that happens, that activates. And he says, whoever's been baptized in Christ Jesus has put on Christ. So if you have not been baptized in Christ Jesus, you have not put on Christ. You believe in Jesus, but you haven't put him on yet. How do you put him on? Baptism, according to the Bible. If you, ha if you haven't been uh, baptized, you haven't died in Christ. In other words, you haven't officially entered into what his death paid for. Now that's serious. When before we're born again, before we get baptized in water, we belong to the generational line of Adam. That's what it linked to. Once you go, get baptized, you're putting to death that genera generational line that leads to Adam as your ancestor. And you're born again. When you come out of the water, you're in newness un of life and you've put on Christ. In other words, now you belong to Christ and your generation links back to uh, Jesus, not Adam anymore. Do you understand? It's very powerful. So if you do want to get baptized, please talk to me. Tell Tess. Talk to Richard. Any one of us, just let us know, hey, I want to get baptized. I want you to know also something else. I was baptized three times. I was baptized when I was a baby. That meant nothing to God. Again, God's not heartless. It just, if someone 
imagine this. If someone says to you, hey, the way we do communion is you take the, the cup and you take the bread, okay? And this is my body, this cup is the blood. And you, instead of doing that, you say, okay, I'm not going to do communion that way anymore. What I'm going to do instead of taking the bread, I'm going to do two push-ups. And instead of taking the cup, drinking of the cup, I'm going to do three star jumps. Is that okay? Can we, are we allowed to change things like that? Are we allowed to do such a thing? No. So in the same way, removing what baptism does and saying, oh, you just have to say a prayer now or something like that is not valid. It's just a silly and it just also doesn't mean anything to God. You understand? It's man-made stuff. So getting baptized as a baby was never something God put together. It was people that put this together, religious groups that said that your baby, if it's not baptized when it's a baby, it's going to go to hell if it dies. Can you believe that? They were saying an innocent baby will go to hell because they were born in original sin. That is not true. Okay, so please talk to us if you want to get baptized. So one of the things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do different topics, short answers. Some of them are going to be long answers. Some will be things you already know, but you can, you, some of the answers I'm going to give, you believe in God, but you might not, if someone asked you a question about this topic, you might not know how to answer. But in the Bible, it says to be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you for the hope that is in you. So these uh, answers you can give when you ask these questions. One of the popular things that I get told, some of this is basic, but it's good for you to know as an answer what to say to people that will ask you. Why? Because here we're to equip the body of Christ to go out there and know who they are, know what to answer when something comes at them and know how to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might when they get attacked by the enemy. Okay? So one of the questions I always get answered, asked is, who created God? So one of the questions was, if God created us all, who created God? That's a good question. But the only reason someone asked that question is because they were born on earth. And I'll explain what I mean by that. When we're born on this earth, we're born in time. In time. We're born trapped in the reality of time. So all we know is time. Inside of us, there's an eternal clock, which means it ticks. That's why we are getting old and it ticks until it stops ticking. And what happens when it stops ticking? You die. So check this out. There's a beginning, we're born, and then we die. And in between that is the, the beginning of the clock. Tick, 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 until the end, and it stops. Because we're born in this, we're also, there's an internal clock. It's called inside of us. Scientifically, we have an internal clock. We know things are ticking down. So with us as well, when we hear about, when we see something, we believe it has to be an end, a beginning and an end. We start eating, we finish eating. We wake up, we go to sleep. We start work, we finish work. We don't understand the concept of eternity. I can say to you, hey, do you believe forever, that there's forever? You can say yes, but all you're doing is mentally you're saying yes. You have no idea. I have no idea what it feels like. I've never experienced the, ex the experience of no time, of what it feels like not to think about, oh, I've got to finish this by this, or I've got to do that by then, or I have to finish this. We have no idea what that feels like. So when we, are got, when someone when you say you believe in God and then God says, I'm the eternal God, for everlasting to everlasting. He's forever. He's always was. He says, we say this, but when the non-believers will ask you how, who created God, it's because they are trapped in time. So they think God had a beginning. He always was. That's the answer. He just always was. What was he doing? Anything he wants to. Maybe he was creating some bakery stuff <laughs> to eat. Maybe he just thought, I'll go create some angels, a few rainbows here and there. And then he decided, hey, I'm going to create humans. And he creates the humans, the heavens and the earth, and all there is therein. You understand? So that's why when someone asks you where, who created God, you, you explain to them you're only asking this because you believe there has to be a beginning and there has to be an end. With God, he's not trapped in time. In fact, if he was trapped in time, time would be God. Why? Because he has to submit to the authority and power that time has over him. He's outside of time and he doesn't submit to time. He goes into it, out of it, does whatever he wants with time, takes it away, removes it completely if he wants to, but he's outside of it. Okay, he created time. So that's the answer to that. This is how we're going to be going. Another question. Why would a loving God send someone to hell? 
Who has heard this question? Who has thought this question? I used to think these questions. Why would a loving God, if God is love, why would he send someone to hell? It's a good question. So this is what we're doing today. You get the flow now? Basic questions that you would hear, but the reason why I need to talk about them is because we need to equip the saints for what's happening out in the world. Why? Because God loves the world and He sends us into the world to help those who still don't know Him to come to know Him. Well, these are some of their questions. Who created God? Why would a loving God send someone to hell? Good question. So let's answer that one. Did God create hell? Yes. It's very clear in the Bible. And we're going to explain why and for who it was. I wrote something here. Hell is the prison he created for the devil and the rebellious angels. The ones, the angels that chose to obey. Satan was an uh, in charge angel. In other words, he called an archangel. He was angelos. Uh, Michael is also an archangel. So is Gabriel. Satan, his name was not Satan. It was called Lucifer and he lost his name. Now he's called Satan because he means the one who goes against God, the opposer of God. He lost his name and was given a new name to describe what he's like. He was in charge of angels. That's why in Revelations it says this, when Satan was cast down, a third of the angels were cast down with him. These would have been the one third of angels. And I don't know, a third of what? A third of a million? A third of a billion angels? A third of 65 billion? 500 billion? 500,000 billion. I have no idea what a third of or what. You understand? But there was a third of the angels that went down with him. So hell was actually created for uh, the devil and his angels. They're not, um, it's not a, his kingdom or something. It's a place that's created that he's going to be thrown into. Um, hell, hell is the prison he created for the devil and the rebellious angels. Now he hasn't been judged yet completely. So there was angels, uh, forget that. Let me continue because I'm going to take you to a whole history lesson. We'll stick to this bit here. Uh, what happens though, hell is a prison for the devil and his rebellious angels, but those who willingly indulge in Satan's ways and won't repent will also go there. You understand? So the reason why there's people going there, Satan seduces and tempts all the world, including us. And anyone that understands they shouldn't do what, they should, what they're doing and willingly wants to do what the devil wants them to do, will also, they willingly, they knowingly want to do what is evil. They know it's evil and they want to do it and won't repent. They will go to what, where uh, the place that was created for the devil and his angels because they wanted the devil's ways. They go to where he's going. So people say, but why would a loving God allow that? Why would... He allow people to go to hell. I want you to think a little bit with me, okay? First, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 to 46. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, this is Jesus, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice what this was created for. That's what he was prepared for. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Do you know why this is happening? These people were not doing anything that was selfless because all this is selfless is because they were too uh, focused on themselves and their own life. These believers. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting. What is it? Everlasting. That means eternal, forever, punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. We are eternal people. We're going to live forever. Our body dies, but we're going to live forever. Where we're going to live is a totally different story. I see many posts on Facebook many times. Someone dies and they'll say this, enjoy paradise. Rest well in paradise. Uh, see you in paradise. Very sure of that, really. They think everyone's going to paradise. But why would a loving God send someone to hell? But that's a mis 
and wrong understanding about God. Think about this. Who here has broken God's ways, have done what is evil in all their life? Think from, from the beginning to up to now, whatever your age is, who has knowingly, willingly, you knew what you were doing, did what was wrong? I think all, who's, some of you are lying as well because you won't put your hand up. <laughs> so add that to your wrong. <laughs> I'm a liar. No, I'm a Christian liar. It's different. No, you're still a liar. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we've all done wrong, right? We've all done wrong. And even when we come to God, it's not okay, but we still stumble at times, choose to do the wrong thing. These, if someone breaks the law of the land, okay, of the world, what do you call them? If they break the law and they are judged and they were found guilty, what are they called? Criminals. Who here, I ask the question, who here has broken God's ways, God's laws? Put your hand up, ever, ever. Have you ever done the wrong thing? Okay, three of you haven't, wow. But others, bravo for your honesty now. <laughs> it's like my hand's heavy, I don't want to lift it up. Okay, all done wrong, right? So therefore we are criminals. So to say, how can a good and loving God send someone to hell is the opposite thing to be saying. What should we be saying is this. The more correct statement should be, what a loving and merciful God who makes it possible for even criminals to be cleansed, forgiven, and undeservingly enter his paradise world called heaven. Isn't that the truth? You get the difference? We put this blame on God as if he's this harsh, bad person, not realizing we were all going there because we broke the spiritual ways. So we couldn't enter heaven. Why wouldn't he allow all of us to go to heaven? Sorry? Because he's just and he's good. And he's loving and love. Do you know what he does? He protects. If someone's a criminal and doesn't want to change, remember, I'm not talking about those who want to change. But if someone's a criminal, a rapist, and wants to come into your house and you have your two daughters and your wife, men, I'm talking to you, but I know you women will probably jump in first. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about the men right now for a second. Yeah. But if a criminal is trying to open and enter your door, or even just knocking first, he stand knocking, and you say, let me into your house. Remember, Jesus says in my father's house, what's heaven? God's house. And so this person that doesn't want to change, is a criminal, wants to enter your house, doesn't want to say, I'm sorry, doesn't want to say, I want to obey by your rules. I just want your house. I like what's in your house, especially your wife and those two daughters of yours. What are you going to do, men? No, no, except for Solomon. Everybody else, what would you know? <laughs> what would you do? Would you let him in? Huh? No, why? Aren't you loving? Come on. You've got to be loving and merciful. Shh, you're just so judgmental. Huh? You call the police, sorry? Because they're criminal. So why wouldn't you allow them in? Why? Is it because you're unloving? Why? Tell me an answer though. If it's not because you're unloving, because we do this to God, we judge Him immediately. Oh, if God's so loving, why would He do that? Listen to what we do to God. And when I ask you, would you do that at your house? And you're like, no, no. I will call the police. I will stop them. I wouldn't let them in. Why wouldn't you let them in, man? Aren't you merciful and loving? That's not mercy. That's not love. That. That's true. Because what will love do? It will protect the household. Do you get what love will do? Love also protects from what is evil. If God allowed every person to enter heaven, do you know what would happen? You ready for this one? Not just chaos, but really good. You'll get, you get this. I want to say in a language we, are, we know, we immediately go, ah, heaven will become just like earth. Did you see what's happening? Pedophiles, murderers, thieves, everything. Heaven will become just like earth. Are you okay with that? No. You see now when you put it in the real way of thinking, you're going, wow, God, thank you. Thank you for stopping just anybody not wanting to change to come in because heaven would become just like earth. In fact, I'll, I'll say a comment that I heard someone say before. They said, 
I forgot who exactly said it. But they said, have earth is the closest thing to heaven to a paradise that a person that's heading to hell will ever experience. Because many people say to me, here is hell. Earth is hell. You'll hear this when you go on the street and start talking to people because they went through bad stuff. It's been difficult for them. I understand. But this is not hell. This is amazing. In hell, they struggle to breathe. Every breath, like, uh, uh, trying to breathe. Even breathing is like, oh, I wish I could breathe like I used to on earth. Everything's different because God gives the breath of life. God gives peace. God gives hope. There is nothing of God there. Why? That's what they wanted. They didn't want God. So they get what they wanted. You don't want God here. Okay, let me move to the next bit. So love protects and you would honestly also say you would protect your household from anyone that's criminal to enter in. See how good God is? He allows us to have a chance as criminals to say, God, I'm sorry for being a criminal against you, against others. Forgive me, cleanse me. And he allows you to come into his house, which is a world, paradise world called heaven. Um, should a Christian, Christians mix with politics? Yes, yes absolutely. Many, I, you don't understand guys, I get messages from people <laughs> telling you, you shouldn't mix Christian politics. I have mess messages from other Christians that have been hurt because their pastor is going off at them telling them you shouldn't be talking about politics, let politics be politics and God be God, blah, blah, blah. But if you read the Bible, God always mixed with politics. We just read the Bible. He made sure he put people in there. He made sure to take prophets to the king to stop him from what he's about to do because otherwise God's going to judge him. He was always, always interested. In fact, when God appointed what? Kings. Well, what is he doing? He was appointing government. King elders da, 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 to what to take care of the city of the town of the country he was always into politics so absolutely okay we know Moses he goes into Pharaoh which was the president of the United States of Egypt I'm just kidding can a man ready for the next one can a man have long hair and a woman have short hair this is also a question that I get a lot people Churches are really, uh, they sometimes teach very strongly. Uh, man cannot have long hair. Woman cannot have short hair. And where do they get this from? I used to be very fanatical about this topic until I got to know God more. And then he showed me other scriptures that uh, speak differently about the same topic. And I realized, okay, when I see a scripture saying that it's okay, that it's, it's honestly does say don't do this here and then he says in another place you can then I realize God's not very serious about this he's not it's not fundamental uh, what I mean by that is this God always says do not lie he, he never you never find the scripture that says you can lie sometimes you'll you never find the scripture that says this ready you can do white lies he never find the scripture that says this you can lie if it's going to protect somebody a lie is a lie Okay, mothers and fathers, demonstrate Jesus to your kids when you're home because what they see is what they will end up being like. You can come here and lift your hands up and show your Christianity, but they know you're acting because they sing something else at home, especially when this, bring, bring, Auntie Maria is calling and your son picks up the phone. Neth, yeah. Auntie Maria, yeah, yeah, hi Maria. And your, the mother is saying, I'm not home, I'm not here, I'm not home, tell her I'm not home. Tell her I'm not here. What are you telling your son to do? What was that again? Okay, and then don't forget on Sunday, let's go to church, honey. Jesus doesn't want you to lie. And he just sounds like confused. He's like, um, do you know what my dad used to do? Since I was little, Cigarettes always there with his hand in his mouth. You said to me this, don't you ever smoke, smoking's bad for you. I better never see you smoke, huh? I'm thinking, if it's so bad, why is he doing it? So do you know what I wanted to do when I grow up? 
especially steal my father's cigarettes. <laughs> That's how I started. I started smoking. Why? Hypocrisy. Please, what this is coming out for you. I did not write this down. Some here are doing that. Just remember, in the Bible, it says, when you're leading people, don't do it like a person that's trying to tell people what to do only, but be the example. Okay? Start, let's start being the example, okay? Anyone can act like a Christian around Christians. I've seen the best actors in church. You praise God. Everything's awesome. Hallelujah. Don't tell them I'm home, son. Don't tell them I'm here. Anyway, can a man have long hair and a woman have short hair? 1 Corinthians, how, how, do, how did this even come about? It's not because it, people are stupid or Christians wanted to put oppressive stuff on everybody. It's because scriptures were there. And they read these scriptures. And I believe the reason why we can get some of the scriptures wrong or all of them is because we read them without the Holy Spirit's understanding. He's the one who authored the Bible. And if we don't get to know him well in his heart, we will read the passage and not hear the heart behind the passage or even other passages to explain it further so we don't be so fanatical about something or even hard on people about something that God's not hard about. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Uh, I'll keep going after that. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is man. The head of a Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Who's his head? Who's the man's head? Christ. Okay, remember this. You have to. Just go. Don't lose him. Okay, listen to what he says. But I want you to know that every head of a man is Christ and the head of a woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man, he's talking to a church here, the church of Corinth. So learn, know the context as well. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. What is that saying? If any man trying to prophesy or what is it? Pray with his head covered, dishonors his head. Who's his head? Okay. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one that the same as if her head was shaved. That's where you get some of the believers, even the old way, in the Orthodox Church, you see the women wearing the, the veil over their heads, especially the older women. You see them, our grandmothers will do that all the time. This is where that came from. And also you go some denominations of Christianity that will have the women, they will wear other hats. That's why you see in the gospel churches, like in America, they will wear these awesome hats. The black women that, you know, you, they wear the awesome hats because they're covering their heads. It's actually part of their traditional religion denomination of how they believe things. But it came from Corinthians. So let's keep reading. In fact, in, in, in uh, my church in Australia, these women came in. I have no problem with anyone doing whatever, you know, coming and enjoying God and church and all that and fellowshipping. But when they came, they wanted to, they, every time church would start, they would put the covering over their heads. And then, and no problem, if that's what you want to do, do it. But then they started pushing this on all the women. They started grabbing the women on the side and telling them off, why aren't you covering your head when the, the word is being preached or when a song is playing or we're worshipping God or we're praying. So it's very important. So you might make some friends from those kind of circles and you can help them by helping them and talking to them about this because there's freedom. We've been bound with all these traditions and stuff that didn't really, God was not fanatical about and we made it so serious and attack each other for silly things that mean nothing, that don't change your heart, that don't make you love God more. It's none of that. Uh, for if a woman is not covered, let her also... So if a woman is not covered, let her also be shaved. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Just that should get you to go, what? But I want you to think about something. In Genesis, that's why you have to know the Bible. It says that God, when he created them in his image, his likeness, he created them male and female. Created he them. So it was both of them, he said this over them. He says here, 
For man indeed was not cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For man is not from woman, but woman is from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Ready? And they stop there. See, women, if you stop there, 100%. You women, you have long hair and also have covered hair. But listen to what it continues there. Nevertheless, don't worry about what I just said. Now there is man independent of woman, or no woman independent of a man in the Lord. Did you hear what just happened? He first explained how it is before the Lord. But then he says, hey, nevertheless, now there is the man independent of a woman, nor a woman independent of a man in the Lord. Are you in the Lord? So this is what we read next. For as a woman came from man, even so man also comes through a woman. But all things are from God. That's his actual answer. You see? So if you stop short, you just came out of context and didn't finish what his point was. So all these people try to do all these different stuff that never came from the Lord because uh, uh, Paul speaks very sarcastically. He says, da -da 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 -da. what? Did that come from you? And then he answers his real answer. But if you don't understand about that, about this character in him, you think that he was being serious about that. And he continues, verse 13, the whole thing. This is the whole chapter. So you know, in context. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her hair uncovered? There's the question. Is it okay? Does not even nature itself teach that if a man has long hair, it is dishonored to him? Another one says it is shameful to him. That's where they get, men should not have long hair. So there is scripture in the New Testament. That's why you have to know, hey, why did they get this from? They're not silly. They read this. But if a woman has long hair, it is glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. What's given her for a covering? You understand what your covering is? What's your covering? Your hair. Okay. Uh, but if anyone seems to be contentious, wants to argue about this, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. He just said, I don't care about this stuff. Don't worry about it. If you want to be fighting about this, it's not a big deal. But yet, it's become a big deal. Jesus was known to have come from the, from the Nazarites. The Nazarites was where Samson came from. Samson, long hair, long beard. You were never meant to cut his hair. And if you cut his hair, what happened when they cut his hair? You saw the movie. I know most of you didn't read the, the Bible story of it. What happened? He loses his power. Look at how God was making sure that you understand that he doesn't care about have men having long hair. He made sure that the guy, it wasn't his long nails that he had a power. It was his long hair. That it was shameful, he says in Corinthians. No, it wasn't a big deal. That's why God made sure Samson would have his strength from there. Amen. So that's another one. Can a Christian drink alcohol? I get this till this day from Christians, which is fair enough. Thank you. Ask the question. And I'm okay if you decide one or the other. It's your choice. It's no problem. Okay. But if you hear the answer that you could be wrong, don't fight your brothers and sisters over them wanting to do it. Or not do it okay just let him be cool it's not a big deal nothing to argue about in fact in the Bible it says if your brother thinks that eating meat is wrong don't say anything don't eat meat if he if it's gonna offend him if you're at his house and he doesn't want to give you meat and you think it's gonna offend him because he says this his faith is weak that's why he thinks not eating meat is okay you that your faith is strong don't worry don't fight about that stuff go no problem where's the Vegetarian, vegan stuff. I'll eat it, no problem. Pray for it, done. So in the same way, let's have this heart to do with alcohol. I do not drink alcohol. I just want to make this statement clearly. I don't drink alcohol, okay? So I'm a good person to be speaking about this. Why? Because when someone drinks alcohol and wants to be drinking alcohol, they want to defend what they do. I don't drink alcohol, so I don't need to defend nothing. What's going to amaze you is, I'm not against people drinking alcohol. 
How come? Because I read the Bible, went to the Lord about it, and I am settled in the scriptures and saw all of the different ones and came to their conclusion, looked at the history even of the Jews because of one big thing. What happens? What's Jesus' first miracle? He turned the water into wine. It's a good question. Someone said to me once, because it was so clear, they turned the water into wine. I went, okay. So the ones who are against alcohol, Christians who are against drinking alcohol, started teaching. I'm not talking about Christians. It always comes from theologians, pastors, big guys, from started schools, started influencing the different people, and then they started repeating the same thing. Um, when you look at history, so they started saying to me, no, no, when Jesus changed the water into wine, it was good grape juice. Really good grape juice. And it was so good grape juice because they were drinking that grape juice so much. They loved that grape juice. When that grape juice ran out, Jesus made sure to turn more water into grape juice. And it was better grape juice than the one they were having. It's amazing grape juice. All you got to do to fix this, again, I have no agenda. I'm not going to drink after this. There was no reason for me to be looking at this. I researched and even literally was asking every Jew I ever met, anytime I met a Jew, one of my questions was this. Hey, in the old days, in weddings, did you guys, you're a Jew, you know your grandma's, 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 grandma, grandma you know your history. Did at any time in weddings you celebrate by drinking grape juice or was there wine? And Honestly, man, it was like a joke I was saying to them. They're like, what are you talking about? Wine. Of course it was wine. Actual wine. Every single time. Do you know the only ones that would say it wasn't is those who are against drinking alcohol. So they had to defend the doctrine instead of just be honest. Now, what I've also heard, and I understand my brothers and sisters that would say this to me, hey, don't say that. Because then it might make the guy that wants to drink alcohol, like a Christian that's trying to change, he might make him go back to drinking again and then he'll have a problem again. So I should lie to him. So you want me to lie to him? We just spoke about lying. You understand what? You want me to lie to him so he doesn't stumble, he doesn't fall? He doesn't... No, I say the truth. What's going to make him change? Him looking at the thing that's possible, just like a prostitute, is possible for any one of us to go to tonight. I choose not to. Alcohol. I was drinking a lot. I choose not to. God can do all things. Everything is possible with God. But I don't need to be uh, uh, deceived and lied to by my own brothers or sisters so he can convince me of something not to touch it because uh, God said, don't never touch it. He doesn't say that. And if I'm willing to lie to them about that, what else am I being lying, lying to them about? What am, I, uh, what am I willing in the sake of protecting them? That is not protection. First of all, you're a liar. It's deception. That never helps the cause. So it was actually alcohol. That he made what's in the bible very clearly do not get drunk do not get drunk do not get drunk do you know why i stopped drinking in the beginning i didn't even realize when it started happening if i started drinking one beer i was a hundred percent gonna finish drunk i couldn't stop it when you know that you have a problem with something or you had a problem with something just don't touch it because you know that if you take the one maybe you'll take the two and you just said i'm only going to have one but you end up having two. Then after you have the two, you say, I'm just going to have one more. I still feel okay, really. But that's what you want to say because now you want to get a little bit more of the buzz. Yeah, no, I'm still good. I can handle my alcohol. I'm good, man. I just, just had four. I'm good. Look at me. I'm good. Really? Okay. Good, man. Just be honest with yourself. Let God change you. But I'm not going to put you doctrines and stuff that God never put on you. In fact, he says that. Don't put people on burdens on people that I never put on them. Don't. If you, but I want to say the other way. When I spoke to Christians that wanted to argue with me, I, I didn't say anything. Hey, Andrew, I go, I didn't drink. Someone was, we're at a, a barbecue or something, a Christian. And they had the beers there. No problem. Have the wine there. Do you want something to drink? I go, no, I don't drink. I said, and they said, well, are you saying you shouldn't be drinking? I go, I never said that. And they get defensive. And I'm like, wow, he has a problem. Immediately, you can see it. He's just defended. Why are you defending it? I didn't even say a thing, but you're ready to argue and fight with me about alcohol. What does that mean? Something's wrong. You have a problem with alcohol. Stop it. You do need to stop it. 
So I said, he, I, said, I said, listen, man, I don't mind if someone drinks, just don't get drunk. The Bible says don't get drunk. And if you know that if you're going to do one, you're going to do two, don't lie to yourself. Don't drink at all. Stop it. For your own sake, don't let anything bind you, put you back into a place where you go, it's going to take you downwards. And he said, no, I have no problem with drinking. I have no problem if I don't drink. I said, okay, let's do a deal, I said to him. Don't drink for two months. What? Why? I don't have to not drink. I don't have to prove anything. He started talking like this again, angry. I'm like, you really have a problem. This guy needs to stop drinking big time. You get it? Just be honest with yourself. That can happen to you with a show that you like watching. You could be with someone that's precious, a treasure right in front of you that God is ministering to through you. And you're watching if it's seven o'clock because the soccer's going to begin. Soccer. Soccer's going to football. Football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to go. I got to go. Catch you later. Football. You're in the middle of doing something for God or whatever. And it's okay with having football, but don't let football have you. Don't let your show have you. Don't let your money have you. Just be careful. Test yourself. In fact, I used to do that. I used to test myself if I can handle stopping something if I got too obsessed with it. And I would do it just to make sure nothing has, has me. So, the moral of the story is, don't get drunk, <laughs> okay? And if you ha had a problem with alcohol coming to the Lord, you know that you liked getting drunk, be honest with yourself. So don't, I will, I will really encourage you, don't touch alcohol. Don't drink. Strengthen yourself in that, okay? He's worth it. For you to grow in this area okay in fact i don't actually understand what the point is in some of the alcohol they taste like crap like beer i can't believe i was drinking that thing it's like if you really be honest about it a whiskey or vodka, that's why they put so much sugar make it red and green now and things like this so you can keep drinking anyway it's my theories should christians watch horror movies no, I hear no from someone. I won't ask you the question because some of you might say, yeah. And then you're like, after I finish speaking, you're going to wish you didn't say yes. But listen, guys, uh, I'm not going to go into the full story, but I've cast out demons, not once, from people. And the, where they got the demon from was watching a horror movie. I'll say that again. I've cast out demons, not just once, of people, and where they got the demon from was watching a horror movie. When you willingly give into something, these are called eye gates. What you see goes into your soul. You're allowing into your soul. What you're listening to goes into your soul. They're gateways to go into, to enter into. What you willingly allow, not, the, the, what, not what you're not willingly allowing, what you're willingly allowing to give yourself to will have itself into you. And you can go there saying this, but I don't, I'm not going there to get demons. I'm not going there because I agree with Satan or witchcraft or whatever that scary horror movie is showing. I'm just going there just to watch the movie. It does, Satan doesn't care why you went. You keep thinking that what you think matters to Satan. He doesn't care. When you give in to playing with his stuff, he plays back with you. So I want to tell you clearly, I've seen it with my own eyes where I've cast out demons out of people because they were watching uh, horror movies. When your heart, when you, when you jump at certain scenes in a movie of a horror movie, what's happening is a torment of your soul. Your soul is actually reacting. It's aching. It wants to react because you're aching it. You're hurting it. It's like beating up your soul. It can't handle what you're showing it. You're literally hurting it. So, Yes, and it's not just goes to horror movies, guys. It's to many other things that are, belong to the devil, belong to the enemy. You've got to be careful what you're watching. Clean yourself up. Set yourself apart. It's not funny. It's not a joke to be giving yourself into these things because Satan's going to hurt you. He's out to hurt you. In fact, and I want to take your question. In fact, many of these ideas from these horror movies, I don't watch horror movies, Many of the ideas of these horror movies, how did these guys get into these ideas, man? Who do you think was inspiring them to write down the script that they were writing? You think it was just them? Yeah. They're getting ideas and they think, yeah, and then cut his fingers off and the other guy eats the fingers and then rips their guts out. And Who thinks like this? Unless you're literally disturbed hearing some demonic 
thing speaking to you. And then we're watching this and there's literal sections of the movie where it's designed to make you jump, which are, affects your soul to be open to be infected by demonic. And like I said to you, this is not a theory. I've cast out demons from people that have watched our scary movies. There's people that get addicted to porn because the eye gates, when they were little, some friend came to show them a magazine of pornography or a little video on their, on their phone or something that opened up their eye gate and infected their soul. And now this is causing them to want desire to want to watch these kind of things. So it's very serious what happens. That's why you got to be serious about what you give yourself to because you belong to Christ now and you want to be holy, not because you're scared of God, but because you don't want to participate in the things of the enemy that way he's had you bound. One of the last movies I even watched was called Saw, the first one that came out. I think that was the last scary movie I ever watched again. But that is disgusting. How did the guy think what he's thinking to write this kind of script? He's completely demonically possessed. So, yeah. So, what about modesty? Ooh, I'm going to go. There's many stones here. Please don't throw them. I'm going to stick to one part of the modesty. Nah. Modesty is what you dress like. Okay? Okay. So, what, what is, is, is there modesty biblically? Of course. But because there was no definition in the Bible, it didn't describe exactly what it looks like, everyone's different. There's a move, especially on women, but all men as well, of course, but it's more on women for some reason. It's, it's sad. It, it's, it's really sad. I would, I would say for modesty, just with swimming, now it's summer. I, I, I lose friends when I talk with this one. Wearing your underwear at the beach and calling it swimwear, it's still your underwear. I know, it's revelation. But let me say that again. Wearing your underwear at the beach, but calling it, no, it's swimwear. Okay. It's still underwear. You understand? That's what, for some reason, the culture of the world has convinced us that it's normal, it's okay, what's wrong, everyone else is doing it. So if that's the case, I can go to somewhere where everyone's doing heroin or cocaine, and I can do it. Because it doesn't say in the Bible not to do cocaine. So if I'm where everybody else is doing it, according to that theory, then it's okay to be doing cocaine because everyone else is doing it there. And again, if you wear this stuff anyway, it's your choice. But I want to be clear with where I see, what I've learned, what I've asked God about. I really, I was asking God, God, tell me, teach me about this. I say to women this, if a, a stranger went into your house, you didn't know about it. Your dad allowed them in, your husband allowed them in, whatever and they were real estate agent, they're going to look at your houses, your rooms, to say what price the house could be. And you didn't know that they were allowed in. And you were in your house changing. And you're changing. And as you're changing, you're still wearing your bra and your underwear. Bra and underwear. And you're about to put your other dress on or whatever. You didn't have time. And the husband or your father, whatever, said, yeah, go look at their rooms. He didn't know what you're doing. Go look at the rooms and give a price. So the guy's opening the doors, looking in the bathroom, opening the other bed, opens your bedroom as a woman. When he looks at you and you see he's a stranger and you notice he's a stranger and he just looked at you with your underwear and your bra, what would your reaction be? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you said, but uh, I don't really want to know. But I'm telling you, every time I've asked an honest woman, not one that already was ready to defend. Because when you talk like this, there's women that are like, <laughs> like, don't you talk about my modesty? It's more, anyway, I said, what would you do? Their reaction, why? Because it's a reflex action, because it's in our DNA to be modest. So it wants to cover what is not allowed to be seen. It's a reflex action. Every person has it, unless it becomes... More and more, because the world keeps saying, show it all, show it all, show it all. And you get used to hardening your heart against your conscience. So you just end up doing it and it's more normal. And you're like, you're just judgmental. Maybe, uh, I don't think so. Maybe that's your deflection not to hear this. So I say, okay, so you're, you would cover yourself ah! and do that. Ah! You know, I would probably do it as well. If someone went in and uh, 
Oh, oh, okay, it's okay. Yeah. And then, it's day at the beach. The next day, got my bra on, got my underwear on, and the woman's walking around with strangers everywhere looking at her. It's no problem, it's normal. It's the beach, it's normal. You know, the guys stop perving when at the, at the beach. They were good boys. Yeah, it's okay. Your husband, it doesn't matter to your husband now that his wife is showing everybody their body. It's okay. Pfft. It's the beach, man. And you know what? Again, a non, a person that doesn't want to change would say, now nah, you're just being legalistic. You're being judgmental. You're being this. What if you're being lukewarm? Have you ever thought the opposite side? What if there is a standard for God? And I'm not telling you what that is. I'm saying to you, have you ever asked him? As a queen, as a king, I will be the same for men. Grown men walking around and they've got the, not even the boxer shorts. They're wearing like, and they're walking around like, put a pants on, right? Sometimes they do that here. I'm like, I'm not, I'm on both sides. It's crazy. And when you see that on men, you're like, well, I'm coming with those. You know? But it's, a, it's normal. It's not normal. It's become normal. Do you know what I heard someone recently on a YouTube video thing? Interviewing somebody. They said, listen, and I've heard this. It's a, well, it depends on the culture of the place you're in. I agree. But such an excuse for where they put this little excuse in. And the guy said, well, I'm in, I'm in California. In California, it's normal to be half naked walking around. That's normal. That's the culture, really. So that's okay with God. As a Christian, that's okay because you live in California and it's okay to walk around nearly naked. It's okay. Okay, say that to Sodom and Gomorrah. Wasn't it their culture to do what they were doing? Was God okay with it? But it was their culture. It became normal for them to do everything they were doing there. God didn't say, well, it's their culture. Christians say things like this. Now, do I agree about the culture? Yes, when it's a right context. If we went to an Amazon jungle and there was a tribe there and they walk around naked, this is their culture. They've never looked at a TV. They've never had a phone. They've never had an encounter with another person and they walk around naked. It's their culture. I wouldn't say a thing about their culture. Yes, now that's true. That's the new true context of it's their culture. You get the difference? So when people in California, in Australia, in here, Cyprus, well, it's the culture here. It's okay. It's normal. Yeah, it was normal for Sodom and Gomorrah as well, but God was still not okay with it. Amen? So this is, I just want to talk about the obvious. Now, about the other side of things to do with normal dress codes of walking around, blah, blah, blah. You know, just, just start talking to God. Ask Him, is this okay with you, God? Talk to Him, man. He's your dad. He loves you so much. Just start being honest even with that bit. Ask Him and you'll feel in your conscience if you shouldn't be wearing that stuff anymore or this stuff anymore or whatever. So, last but not least, can we pray to saints that have already died and gone to heaven? Do you know why I'm doing this? Because I'm also recording it. And there's people that are going to get something out of this. More than some of you guys, because you already know, it's a no. <laughs> but why is it a no? Are you saints? Are you guys saints? You guys that are alive right now here, you watching that are Christians. Christians, are you saints? Yes, according to the Bible, literally over and over, there'll be letters in the Bible saying this, to the saints at Ephesus, to the saints in Corinth, to the saints, and he's talking about to the saints, to the saints, to the saints. We are meant to pray for one another while we're here on earth. It says in the Bible to take each other's burdens, to pray for one another. Yeah, so we're meant to pray for one another while we're here on earth together to take up to the Lord the things that are hurting you or bothering you or whatever. But when someone has passed on, a Christian has passed on, Apostle Peter, Apostle John, all the saints that passed on, we are not meant to talk to them. It is very wrong. In fact, I want to tell you a quick story of that and then we'll finish. In Acts chapter 3, verse 11, this is after Peter and John prayed for this man and he gets healed and he starts jumping and it was, a, you know, it was an amazing miracle, notable miracle. And he says this, when they saw this, 
And as the lame man which was healed, Acts chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, as the lame man was healed, uh, was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, you men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why do you look at earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? And right after that, you keep reading, he starts talking about, hey, it's Jesus whom you denied and crucified. And he starts preaching, it's Jesus who made this man to walk. Did you see what Peter said when he was here on the earth, alive? On the earth. He's still alive, but he's in heaven. When he was alive here on earth, he said, why are you looking at us? It's Jesus who did this. What do you think he'd be saying right now in heaven? If someone's going, oh, Peter, please heal my mother, my father, my sister, or help me with this or help me with that. What would Peter say? Why are you looking at us? As if by our power of holiness, we can make this man whole. It's Jesus you look at. Amen. In, in the one last scripture, in 1 Timothy, verse 2 to 5, See, with us, we can hold each other's hands and I'll, like he can ask me, hey, Andrew, can you pray for me? I'm sick. You can message me and I do that, right? You can say, hey, I'm going through this stuff. Can you be praying for me? And I pray for you because I'm here on earth. But when the, the one that's a mediator between earth and heaven, between God and man is only one. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. So there's only one person that can mediate, bring our prayers to God the Father. That's Jesus. Okay? So remember that. Again, most of this stuff, some you knew, some you I got clarification, and some it was to also help those who have never heard this before that will be watching in the future. Okay? All right, let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you so much, God, for your truth, for your word. Uh, just I pray for any hardness of heart here, Lord God, that heard stuff and uh, wanted to defend their hearts, wanted to defend what they've been already doing. I just pray humility over their hearts, that they will turn that to humbly ask you your opinion on the matter because you are our Lord. We are not our Lord. You are our Lord. We want to bow down to your ways, all your ways in Jesus Christ's name. And I thank you that sometimes it's just the little things that we thought is no big deal that make a big deal to you, that take us further and deeper in you. So we thank you, Lord God. I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray for those watching. Help us go deeper in you, Lord God. Help us see what's in the way to remove it and get it out of the way. In Jesus Christ's name. For those of you that have watched and have been watching horror movies, movies that are sexual, that have inappropriate stuff in them, but you openly watch that stuff. You didn't even turn away. When you saw what it was, you didn't even turn away. That's, that's wrong. In your heart, that should bother you. Even if you didn't know a movie had something sexual and it starts having sexual and you still didn't look away, that is you willing to be open to that area still? And what I want you to do is, uh, we're all going to do this, so that you don't feel like it's pointing to you, but if you have watched horror movies or things that are evil, have evil, things that are literally evil, and promote what is evil, um, and sexual or anything like that, and you're allowed it with your eye gates to go in, I want you to pray with me this right now. We're going to say, in the name of Jesus... Listen carefully before you do it, because we willingly chose to put that into our soul because we gave into it. It's very simple. It's not long praying. We can easily choose to loose it from our soul, release it from our soul. As easy as it came in, it goes out. It doesn't have to feel anything. It's just your repentance is powerful. Your decision to say, I don't want what I allowed in anymore. I want you. And when you release that, we're going to pray for God to fill you in that area. If you're willing to repent today of that, that means stop watching this after that. 
Stop watching scary movies. Doesn't matter. If, but I really like them. Who cares? Many people like some other vulgar stuff. They should stop that too, right? So you stop that one. If you know it's wrong, if you believe it's still okay, good luck and keep doing what you want to do. You're going to do it anyway. But I would, I would hope that you want to change some things today if you heard something. If you've been getting drunk and excusing it and saying, no, nah, no, nah, it was just one drink and I, I don't get drunk and you're lying, be honest with yourself. Stop drinking for a while. Maybe stop drinking completely because it's taking you down. Make some new steps and you go to a new level. Make some new steps and you'll go to a new level. Make some new steps and it will probably release you from other things that were you were finding difficult to be released from, that you felt bound by. Give it to God. So say this now, right? Let's put our hand towards our heart and just repeat this. We're going to do everything in this. I want you to hear what I'm going to say so you know what you're about to say and mean it. In the name of, don't say it yet, in the name of Jesus Christ, everything that has come into my soul, knowingly or unknowingly, from any person, place, or thing that belongs to the enemy, to the devil, in Jesus' name, as an act of my will, leave now from my soul. And then, we're going to stop for a second and let that happen. doesn't matter if you feel something or don't feel something. It's your words and sincerity that have the power. God takes your words and does something because you gave him the permission. Then we're going to say, God, you fill my soul now with your holiness, your purity, your innocence, your love. Okay, so we're going to call that into us. Amen? You ready? Say, Father, as an act of my will, I choose to release from my soul anything that has come inside knowingly or unknowingly from any person place or thing that belongs to the devil that belongs to darkness in Jesus name leave now now say in the name of Jesus I bind to my soul your purity, God, your holiness, your healing, your truth, your faith, your strength, your love, your holiness, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just pray for you. Don't, don't, don't repeat. In Jesus' name, every demonic spirit that had anyone bound, that came from any person, place or thing, you hear me right now. You hear me right now. Go! In Jesus Christ's name, right now. Loose, right now. Get off, get out. In Jesus Christ's name and never return. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise God. That was it. If you want baptism, please come talk to us. Okay, so next week at least if you want. Don't, don't play in and out. If you've been thinking about this, stop thinking. Just come. Die in Christ, raise again as a new life in Jesus' name. Come on, let's do this for real. Okay, come talk to us. If you need prayer, Rich, come up. We're gonna, if you need healing in your body or anything, come up. Rich will be here. I'll be here. Tess will be here. And we'll pray for you.